to end homelessness for one person doesn't mean you need a room until that person dies. It means they need a room for a period of time to get themselves back on their feet and then they can move on and that room can be reused for the next person. Good morning, everybody, afternoon or even evening, wherever you are when you're listening to this. Welcome to episode 69, no sexual innuendos today, ladies and gents, of the Optimize Me Now podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Keeling, the founder of the Bulletproof Business Academy, where we deliver results-focused business accelerator programs designed to give struggling business owners the tools and tactics needed to survive, thrive and grow in business. If you're a business owner struggling in your business right now, or you just don't know how to take it to the next level, then you need to download my Bulletproof business app at bit.ly and either forward slash Bulletproof Android if you're one of those filthy Android users, or forward slash Bulletproof business for you sexy Apple users. It is jam-packed with everything you need to be successful in business, from free training, quizzes, content, to accountability, and powerful tools and calculators designed to give you and your business the boost that it needs. So please remember to subscribe to this podcast. Do it now if you haven't already, and I would really appreciate it if you could just take two minutes out of your day to leave us a beautiful review on iTunes just to help other people who are searching the masses of content that's out there these days to find the stuff that's going to serve them, that's going to help them, and it's going to help them take their lives to the next level. Uh, we go out live on Facebook every Friday at around 10.30 a.m., notwithstanding Facebook Live technical issues. So get yourselves over there and connect with me if you haven't already. Um, just search for me on social media, The Jamie Keeling or Jamie Keeling, and you'll see my spiky head popping up there somewhere or other. Uh, you can also support the show on Patreon, forward slash optimize me now, and that's about it. So all the links are in the show notes. Let's crack on. Today, I have a wonderful guest in the form of Mr. Frank Flegg. Frank started his career as a teacher, but his life mission started to take shape when he was still a student, having had a vision to serve the homeless population through property, something we're going to be talking a lot about today. After building an impressive property portfolio of around 60 properties, he decided to use his hard-won knowledge and expertise to help others achieve success in their own property investing journey, but with a bit of a twist. Here to talk about his unique property franchise, ethical property partners, their mission, their vision, and how on more than 100,000 occasions now he has provided beds and accommodation for homeless people. Please welcome the inspirational Mr. Frank Flegg. Welcome to the show, mate. Thank you, Jamie. We've known each other for just over a year now through the Nick James Mastermind, and um really got to know you a lot better when I saw you speak on stage at Expert Empires, where you talked a lot about your journey and where this all really started for you. Um, now, firstly, let us I'd love it if you could tell the audience in your own words, what is it that you are looking to achieve? What's the point of ethical property partners? Yeah, sure. So I, as, as you mentioned, my um, mission or my my life purpose, if you like, um, started to take shape when I was a student. I'd grown up in West Wales, uh, a bit of a country bumpkin, if, uh, if you, Beautiful if you part like. Of the world. I had, um, absolutely. Yeah. My nearest neighbor was, we had one neighbor and then the next nearest neighbor was about half a mile away. Um, our village was about two miles away that had like a thousand people in it. Our nearest nightclub to give you an idea as, as I was growing up was a 45 minute drive away. So wow. really, really rural. Um, You're not staggering and... home pissed from there in, in the middle of the night. No, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The nearest kebab shop was about seven miles away. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, what that meant was I was quite insulated from homelessness, if I'm honest. I'd, I'd been to London, I'd been to Swansea and Cardiff and stuff, but um, didn't see it on a regular basis. And I went to University of Nottingham and on a daily basis, cycling or walking into uni, I saw people in sleeping bags and it was a real shock. Uh, and, and really, I, I wasn't, I think a lot of us are immunized to it. We get used to it. Um, and it, yeah, it just shocked me. We had um, a, a quite a sad story. My, um, uh, one of my best mates at uni in the first year, his father had passed away during his A-levels and, and lot left him uh, a chunk of money he had a, a, a hundred and fifty thousand pounds, something like that, and very wisely he decided to invest it in a property. And 
he and I and a couple of other mates lived together in this house. And it wasn't your stereotypical um, student house. It had a garage, it had a little garden and stuff. And I started to formulate this idea that we could um, take or interview some of these homeless people, take them for a McDonald's meal and pick someone that we felt we could help to rebuild their life. Um, my idea was we'd take them to a charity shop, help them buy some clothes um, or buy some clothes for them. We'd help them write a CV. They could live in our garage for a few weeks while we helped them to apply for interviews. They could get themselves a job and then we'd help them to get themselves a little bed sit. They'd move out of our garage and we could do it again for someone else. And we had two whole years, second year, third year of uni uh, to do this. Um, I got quite excited about it. Unfortunately, my housemates didn't get quite as excited. They, <laughs> they focused more in on the fact that <laughs> we were going to be like giving the keys to our house to someone we didn't know. But we'd all be going off each day to uni and they'd have like access to our our laptops and our um, mountain bikes, uh, etc. So it didn't happen, uh, unfortunately, but that was the seed of wanting to help the homeless and also the seed of it being a short-term problem. To, to end homelessness for one person doesn't mean you need a room until that person dies. It means they need a room for a period of time to get themselves back on their feet and then they can move on and that room can be reused for the next person. So it started to, um, that that was the seed of it. And I'm, and I'm going back, um, that's a bit embarrassing, 20 odd years now, 19, 18 years ago. So um, oh, Frank, I where did that inspiration kind of come from? You know, when you yeah. were that age, how old were you when you had this idea? So I started uni uh, after a gap year at 18, 19. So I would have been 19, 20. Yeah, first so year 19, so, 20 years um, old. What, no, was it yeah. that, what was it in you? What was the thought processes? What, what was it that you saw that inspired you to think about this problem and to want so desperately to do something about it? I think it was a realisation that um, I was very privileged. I'd been born in a, 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 um, a developed country um, although I was on in the in the time after grants had finished, so it was the the, the era of student loans. Um, I got a hardship grant to go to uni, so I certainly wasn't um, privileged in in you know in that respect. We weren't a wealthy family, um, but I was at university. Um, I uh, taught as a swimming teacher whilst at uni, um, and. I had a mountain bike, I had a laptop, you know, I was wealthy compared to most of the world. There was always that realization there for me. And we had a roof over our heads and these people didn't, yet we had an empty garage. I know it's only a garage, but it's warm and it's it's dry. And it was just a, a realization that with very little inconvenience to us as, as four students, we could really transform quite a few people's lives that was that was my, my my it was just a realization that hang on this is really wrong like we've got this empty room and this person's getting rained on in a freezing sleeping bag uh, on uh, literally a few hundred yards from our house so i think that was the the um the realization the the penny dropping the the motivation and i, and I think it came about because i'd not seen I'd not seen homeless people before. I think that's what it was. I'd just not seen homeless people before in great numbers in any regularity. So how was it then that you saw this great opportunity to really make a difference in the world where most people would <laughs> and have... Didn't, and, <laughs> and didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, but you had, had the idea. idea that... <laughs> but, but you yeah, had the idea. Yeah. And, and most people in that situation, and you know, I probably would have felt the same as your, your flatmates. Like, you're crazy. You want to let a homeless person into our house. We don't know them. You're giving them the keys. That's such a big risk. Why did you think so differently to most other people? Um, well, I, 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 are you saying, why did I take action? Is, is that what you're, well, you're getting to? So the, you the, might have had the idea, many, many people might have had the idea, but what's different? Is that what you're asking? Well, more, more around, there's a risk to doing something like that in terms of inviting somebody who you don't know um, with a questionable background, perhaps, into your home, right? And giving them, that's, that requires a, a, a high level of trust in, and faith in humanity. Um, I think a lot of people would have 
even if they'd have had a flicker of an idea, would have just instantly pushed it out of their mind because, oh, I, I can't put myself, my house, my possessions, my things at risk by doing something like that. Why was it that you f you focused, you saw the, the upside to be much greater than the risk, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a, an idea that you would have run with. So what was it that caused you to think that way? Okay, so um, I understand the question. Thank you. Um, I had the, the same idea twice more times, two, two more times. Um, a few years later, I'd um, been through my very short career as a teacher. I, I, I trained for a year and then taught for two years as a teacher. Kind of put it on the back burner, didn't really think about it much at all. Although I did my teacher training in Cambridge and taught in Nottingham, um, inner city Nottingham, really rough part of Nottingham, and in both areas saw more homeless people, so quite uh, urban environments, but didn't really do much at all. But then I got into my property career, and in 2009, my business partner and I were doing 10 properties at a time. So we were buying, refurbishing, selling around 10 properties at a time. We also had our own portfolio. And what I realized was at that time, and I remember having the conversation with them, we always had at least one, em one empty property because it, we were either just finishing the decoration but didn't have someone ready to move in or we had bought it and weren't ready to do the refurbishment. So there was always an empty habitable property. And I said to him uh, at that time, there's a theme here, what about having a family who, you know, maybe really value having a home for, you know, a two, three bedroom house for a couple of weeks, a month, and we could just, if so long as they were happy to move, they could just move and got to be better than being in a hostel or same, same risks, really. Yeah, but what if they get, you know, leave the door unlocked and someone comes in and takes the boiler and all the copper piping, you know, we we just didn't really have the guts to do it or, or the, the, the creativeness to do it safely. I guess that's what it came down to. Um, I live in Derbyshire now, a beautiful house. We've got a, an outbuilding. Um, I had the same idea, but at that point I had kids, uh, a wife, and didn't feel comfortable having someone that I didn't know very well basically living in the garden. So it didn't happen again. And you can see there's a bit of a trend. So it, it really came to fruition when um, I reached financial freedom um, in, in my 20s and I, I realized that I'd actually repeated the same year about three or four times. So I'd, I'd done a year's worth of work and then I'd done the same thing the next year. My, my net worth was going up, my passive income was going up. I got to the point where I thought, actually, if I just stop now, I'm good for the rest of my life, living a fairly, not multi-millionaire lifestyle, but a fairly comfortable lifestyle. Um, and that actually filled me with quite a lot of um, emptiness. It made me feel quite um, rudderless, if I'm honest. And I thought, is that really what it's about? Like, yeah, I can, I can be a great dad, hopefully. I can focus on being a great husband. I can, you know, have a... Yeah, it, it probably explained me. And I've always had experiences and fun to drop a drive inside of me. And my drive was financial freedom, being successful, doing something I love doing, which I do, I love property. And so that's where I really started to think, what's this driver going to be? What's this um, legacy? What, what's going to get me jumping out of bed of a morning and um, wanting to work really hard? I'd, when I was starting my property business, running a working an 80 90 hour week was normal for me i remember when i kicked off i was doing 13 days out of every 14 uh, I'd, I'd have one sunday off a fortnight um and so i'd got my hours down to um i was doing three days a week at one point um and um and not really needing to do those we were running a team of like 20 odd subcontractors so i sat down and i thought what would get me excited? And it, it coincided with, um, and I, I don't know how much of your audience are, are faith-based, but um, I became a Christian eight years ago, and it coincided with that of like, okay, so what about the rest of this world? What about, you know, a bigger uh, plan? Um, and using the skills that I've been blessed with to um, 
do some good in the world uh, from from a faith perspective as well. So that all came together and I came back to that idea of homelessness. Uh, so it wasn't at the forefront of my mind at that point, but I came back to it and I thought, hang on, now I've got all this property education, all these skills that I've developed over the last um, chunk of time. Um, I don't have to be working my socks off uh, because I'm, I'm financially stable. Um, how can I combine those two? And I've got this passion to help the, the house the homeless. And I came up with two different um, scenarios that would really have an impact on housing the homeless. The first was I could get mega wealthy and be philanthropic and donate to a housing charity or create my own housing charity. Um, the problem that I saw, foresaw with that was I'd need to get to Warren Buffett, Bill Gates kind of level of, in, of, of wealth. And I didn't back myself to do that. I wasn't confident that I had it in me to get to that level of wealth. You know, the odds of that are, are pretty slim if we're being um, brutally honest <laughs> about it. Um, and the problem was, if I didn't get any, the business was going to be quite minor. And I, and I wanted to could make in home. My, my mission, our mission on Ethical Property Partners is to end homelessness globally. And I wholeheartedly buy into that reality that, that we can achieve that. It may not be in my lifetime, but that's what I'm starting. That's what we're, uh, and you, you said in your intro, 100,000 um, nights where someone slept in one of our beds rather than on the street. And so for me, I started with the end in mind, um, to, to borrow um, uh, Napoleon Hill's saying, and um, I think it's Napoleon Hill, might be um, Stephen Covey, but um, I looked at how could I house a massive number of homeless people and i came up with the idea of a franchise if i could help hundreds of franchisees to replicate what i've done in property to get themselves on a solid financial footing they then if i could encourage them to um give back to their communities, house homeless people in their local areas, then we could have a global impact. And um, you, you probably don't know this, but we recently launched in uh, Ireland. So we've got someone building a team of franchisees out in Ireland now. Those guys will hopefully house the homeless. We have a trip to Nepal planned for next year for about 15 of our franchisees because we're going to do um have you heard of the toilet um initiative where you sponsor a toilet in a yes. third world country and yeah, you have a yeah. little picture of the toilet in your toilet have you, have you seen that yeah. yeah we're going to do the same thing with houses so when one of our investors buys a house in the uk we're going to say to them that you just bought a two hundred thousand pound house did you know for two and a half thousand pounds you can buy a house cash we'll build it for you in the pool that will house a a, a family forever or you know for the next hundred years as long as the house lasts would you like to just add two and a half grand and buy a house and we'll take a photo of it you know get a letter from the family saying and you can put it on your wall in your house that's and amazing we and that, we're really excited about that so we're headed to nepal next year as a, as a group so that that we, we've been running stepping stones for about um five years now and that global uh vision is starting to to take shape we've got a long way to go but uh, but i'm very excited about it so that that's kind of the the set of circumstances that that got us to this point i love that and i particularly love that you've decided to leverage your network in the way that you've developed and set up the business as a franchise and and kind of looked at it realistically and gone right okay well this is a big problem um, I'm probably not going to be able to to solve this on my own. And like you said, even if you got to Warren Buffett level, levels of wealth, that's like he didn't get there till he was in his 50s, 60s. You know, he he was pretty old. But you are actually now able to start making a difference right now today without having to wait until you reach that massive level of net worth and and personal wealth, right? Um, and to leverage people who come into that franchise, your partners to help them do the same thing i think is fantastic so is that part of the deal when people buy into your franchise and they want to work with you is like well yeah that's cool so long as you're cool with contributing in this way it's not actually it's not. I, I thought no i thought long and hard about it um uh, in the early days um it was 
part of it, but I've I've, I've moved away from that um, because for me, <clears throat> helping our partners, our franchisees, to become financially freedom, uh, to to reach financial freedom, is a, a mission of mine as well. So if I can help someone who has worried all their lives about money, to rely about money and provide their family, then it's a big win for me. I love that. I'm a teacher at heart. I teach every single day. And I have family them. And that thing for the people that want to learn now about property compared to the, the kids that perhaps didn't <laughs> love you guys in Nottingham. It was a great two years, <laughs> challenging two years. But, um, but if I can help um, people through property, I am a drum of giving back to their local communities. But they might not have actually banging the disease at the moment in Southampton. She wants to um, end cruelty to bears in, I forget the country now, it's somewhere in Asia. But that's her mission. And who am I to say, no, 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 you can't come on my program. You can't invest in property. I'm not going to teach you how to... Um, because she could end cruelty to bears in that country. That, that's awesome. You know, who am I to say no homelessness is, is more important than that? Um, also, some people come on board and they are focused right now on themselves and their family. And that's understandable. You know, um, we've had people come on in their 60s, mid 60s coming on board because they don't yet have a pension plan in place. No pension, no property portfolio. Really worried about I need to stop working in the next five or 10 years have no idea how that's going to work who am i to say sorry can't help you not unless you commit to housing some homeless people now my hope and my faith is that everyone that i help will want to give back at the appropriate time so what if they that they could become really successful in property and then become our biggest houser of the homeless because at that point their their mind can expand and they and they have that mental financial um time capacity to 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 give back so i've actually um over the last two years become far more philosophic about it and and, and a bit more um trusting of you know, what what be will be and 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 a good example is someone came on board recently, a very wealthy person came on board as a, as a franchisee. So um, um, their financial freedom has pretty much assured already. Um, but they have embraced the Nepal part, less so the stepping stones even. They've embraced the Nepal part massively. They're coming with their spouse to Nepal and their circle of influence is massive. Like I wouldn't be surprised if, if, they, if they raised a million, maybe two million pounds in the next few years just to house the homeless in Nepal. And, but I never had that conversation with them up front. I never said, you are going to bring in a load of money, aren't you? Do you know <laughs> what I mean? So it's, um, yeah, so, so to answer your question, um, we, we will work with anyone, but our ethos and our vision, and, and some people have never thought about legacy. Some people have never thought about charity. Um, and so I see that as part of our culture, our vision, our values as an organisation, and... People, when they come on board, certainly aren't offended by them. They're certainly not sat there shaking their heads because then we wouldn't be a good fit. Yeah. But it, but if um, my hope is that everyone will give back and contribute. Yeah. So how you mentioned there that you work with anyone? Is there a, like a selection process for who you choose to bring on as a franchisee, or is it literally look if you've got the money, then come on in and we'll show you how how this is done? My answer is no, no, we don't. We have quite an unusual process. So the process that we have is um, I will give anyone a chance. So we um, run quite an unusual introduction. So normally with a franchise, you will do your due diligence. You will um, go and meet some franchisees, probably do a discovery day, read the franchise agreement. But at the end of the day, you have to take a, a leap of faith. You pay a big chunk of money and you hope that the franchise is going to perform and you're going to be supported as they say it will. And I, I've been a franchisee twice with two different franchises, and I feel it's a bit unfair. You know, what if it's not a good fit? What if they promise A and deliver B, you know, et cetera? So what we do is we, um, we run a four-month trial. So anyone can come onto the four-month trial. They are subject to, like, meeting me and me feeling they're a good fit, but we're very um, uh, open to anyone who, who wants to work with us. Um, 
And in that four months, we give complete access to all our intellectual property. So we have 57 different strategies for investing in property, um, sophisticated property investment. And our goal is in that four months, we get everyone rocking and rolling, um, ideally to get their first no money down transaction under their belt. So a property that they've not had to put money into that's paying them an income every month. Our record this year is someone came on for four months and did six of those signed up deals in in four months wow um at the end of that four month process we then offer for people that we feel would make really good franchisees to come on to the franchise and 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 likewise they've had four months of actually experiencing what it's like to work with us and um, what the team is like at headquarters we meet as a community once a month which is pretty hardcore for a franchise so we have the guys from ireland flying over we have people from newcastle southampton right across the country coming to 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 meet us once a month as a community so there's um 50 two people i think as of today in the community so it's a decent chunk of people not everyone likes that not everyone likes the commitment not everyone likes that sense of community so at the end of the four months we've got a really good feel for who is 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 a good fit for us moving forwards and likewise um and so a proportion of those people then are invited on as franchisees and um and then we enter into the franchise agreement and and get going with with them um, and some people go on their way. They've done a deal. They've done two deals, um, but we don't feel they're a good fit. So um, um, we wish them well. So that that's how we run it. And I think it's a really fair way of people making a decision about whether ethical property partners is a. Good I've not heard of any franchise um, anywhere actually globally that does this. I'm sure they exist, but I've never heard of it. Um, and also, there's a very safe way for us to take on franchisees because a five-year commitment from us to support them. The last thing we want is a, a mismatch for, from it, from anyone's perspective. Yeah, definitely. So, when did you start Ethical Property Partners? When did the business come into existence? <laughs> Yeah, good question. So we've recently rebranded. So um, we, I started Stepping Stones about five years ago, and I started my property franchise three years ago. So we've been going three years. As of today, we've got 43 franchisees and 11 people going through the four-month process. That's where the, the 50, um, 55 people are, uh, uh, have come from. That's phenomenal. I start... I start. Thank you. Um, I started it as the Frank Partnership, um, but the overwhelming, a bit egotistical, perhaps the overwhelming um, feedback from the guys was, "We're not taken seriously because we're not Frank. <laughs> everyone <laughs> wants to speak to everyone wants to speak to Frank." And actually, I didn't want to be the linchpin. I didn't want to have to like do every big deal around the country. I wanted I wanted the guy. Like some of the guys are buying. Um, commercial buildings, you know, really expensive buildings, hotels, etc. And and the people saying, yeah, but I'd like to speak to Frank, you know, just to get his event. And it didn't help. So we rebranded approximately a year as Ethical Property Partners uh, at the request of the franchisees, which is which is cool. That's really interesting. And it, it's a it, you started the business then at a time when property education as a whole, as an industry, was really kind of getting some getting some feet and growing its wings but you've done it in a way that is very very different to a lot of the other property educators that i see out there and it seems like in 2019 there's like everybody's out there trying to be a property investor there's so many companies providing training and courses and mentorship and all this kind of stuff but what i really love about your model and the way you do things is that that four month period where they get complete access to your IP. You know, you both get to see if each other's a good fit without the, the you know, the upfront massive commitment. Uh, although I'm sure there is probably a commitment for the for the four months, right? Um, yeah, they pay for our time. So we we actually run it basically at cost. I'll be open. It's a three thousand pound commitment for four months, uh, which, if I'm honest, is is really low. They get so much content a day a month altogether, weekly webinars. Uh, unlimited access to headquarters on the phone. They get access to our vault. Our vault's got over 30 hours of videos, um, training videos, etc. All the documentation they need, access to the whole, whole power team. So it's 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 run almost at cost that four months. But but it is a commitment, absolutely. Yeah, but you know, you look at three grand. You you could pay three grand to another training provider for a two or three day workshop, right? 
Uh, yeah, know, and, and for this with you, they're getting the four months working with you and the team, all the way IP, the training, the content, and all of that stuff. So, yes, three grand is a, a big number for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, when you look at the, well, you mentioned before, one person had completed six deals in that f- initial four month period, right? So, yeah, let, let's face it, the potential return on investment, so long as they follow the advice and do what they need to do, is easily going to make that money back. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I say to them. I say at the start of the four months, we're on the same team now. We're completely aligned. I want to get you a deal at least in this four months because if you do at least one deal that's thirty, forty thousand pounds below market value or something that you put none of your own money into and it earns you a grand a month forever, it's a no no brainer. You're gonna to want to come onto the partnership. Similarly, you you wanna work your socks off for four months because you wanna prove to me you're going to be a brilliant franchisee so that we invite you onto the franchise so it's a it's a, a win-win and um, not everyone succeeds not everyone does pull their finger out but um we have structured it that way so that we're aligned in being massively invested in their success yeah brilliant and what was it why property why do you love property oh that's interesting i don't honestly know i think it's in my blood because my dad was a, an estate agent two of my uncles um, ran chains of estate agents, owned chains of estate agents. Um, my sum total of training, though, from them was one week's work experience with one of my uncles. So I really should have done better. I should have like <laughs> spent loads more time with them. I should have. Um, uh, well, but the interesting thing is because I didn't, I probably have not gone down the traditional route. So had I spent, you know, a couple of years working with them, or you know opened one of their branches locally and 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 been under their wing a bit more um i probably would have been molded into the estate agent um shape i did run my own estate agency for about um four months six months something like that in november 2007 i opened my doors um ng1 opposite savills middle of nottingham uh, and if if you remember the credit crunch it all happened. It all like the precipice. That's the right word. The edge of the cliff was November 07. I could not have picked a worse <laughs> month in, in a decade. It was the worst month in a decade to open an estate agency. It was just when Lehman Brothers was going pop and all that. Um, we were losing uh, 5k a month when we started. Um, and that. So I've given you the rosy version, but it was pretty tough <clears throat> uh, at the start. And and it forced me to innovate. And it forced me to. Um, come away from a traditional model and um, uh, move into a sophisticated investment model, which is which is what I've cut my teeth through necessity, not through um, what do they say? Necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely, I would have gone bankrupt otherwise. Uh, but fortunately, so I've been investing for thirteen years. Fortunately, I've now got those fifty-seven strategies plus the experience of, of a teacher of being able to communicate them in such a way and train them in such a way that. Um, people who have never done property before, all the way up to people who are really experienced. So some of our investors have got, third, some of our partners, franchisees, have got 30 years experience, have got more properties than me. One guy that's uh, just come on board in the last couple of months, he's done 350 transactions. Wow. Um, and um, <clears throat> and he's come on board and he said, wow, I've never known that you could do it that way or I, I never knew that that was possible. So um, I think it's a bit because I'm a scientist by training, that was my, my degree, a bit because I've really needed to and I didn't have a silver spoon. I didn't have a big war chest of money. Um, um, the necessity is as, as combined with the creativity to, to come up with what we've got today, as well as that massive driver of housing the homeless. Yeah, totally. I had a similar story um, in 2007 because that was the year I decided to buy my first ever house as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Worst time in the world to be buying property. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, so a lot of people lo- lost the shirt. Yeah, yeah, I've still got that property, but um, I think it's worth about what it was when I paid for it back in two thousand and seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have no plans to sell that anytime soon. Um, but at least it's not a loss maker at the moment. Um, mm. with, with the guys and girls who you bring in who've got massive, massive experience like that, you know, thirty plus years and three hundred and fifty transactions. What's what's the appeal of coming in and working with you in your franchise? Often they'll have a portfolio, so people come in with 10, 20, 60 houses um, already in their portfolio, but unless they have been, 
investing massively in their education. So I study real estate in America. I study how they do property investment in Australia. I look at how the big boys in London, Birmingham, Manchester are building million pound, uh, sorry, buying multi-million pound properties. And they don't put a 25% deposit down when they buy a 50 million pound building in, in, in London, for example. Um, and I look at how the big boys do it and how people do it in other countries. And I've, um, where I was sat just now, you see my bookshelf be, be, behind me. I, I read, I devour books, I, I study, I, I just enjoy learning. Um, and and that's a big thing that the franchisees buy into. So when those experienced guys come on board, they're, they're actually in effect paying me to learn for them. And so mm. I'm bringing them the cutting edge. And I, I can go and sit with a couple of lawyers for a whole day to work out one strategy. When it was just me investing on my own, I couldn't do that. I couldn't yeah. afford it. You know, their time, my time. But now I can do <clears> that because then I can help 50 people to go employ that strategy. And some of the stuff that the guys are doing on the partnership now is, is phenomenal. We've got one guy who's got over 50 properties in his portfolio, been investing for 20-odd um, years. And we are our apologies for the phone and hey, no um, we are um going taking one property a month of his portfolio and between three and four times um the profit so we're tripling and quadrupling the profit on each property as we go through his portfolio well you can imagine what 50 plus properties is already making him but then imagine what's happening we've been doing that for like eight months now so he's done eight out of 50 plus properties he's between treble and quadrupling the profit on each one using our strategies and amazingly his time investment his team's time investment is reducing wow. that that's that's phenomenal that that is a game changer for his um retirement you know so it's that that kind of um stuff is is and, and they, each franchisee is different some people come on board with minimal experience so they need to to learn you know the the lower rungs and some people come on board with massive experience so we can really um help them to to tap into the the really uh clever stuff so you're really helping them to fine tune what they've already got as well it's not just about the your strategies and and new properties it's about looking at the portfolio they have and saying right how can we like 10x the efficiency of this absolutely in many ways so how are they capitalizing on brexit now, we've had three years of Brexit. The whole country's fed up of, of talking about it. Um, I've loved it. I don't say it too loudly because people boo and hiss. It's been brilliant for us. Any uncertainty is brilliant because people are holding back from buying, but there are always people that want to sell. So we've been filling our boots with property, and long may it continue, and I'm not political in any way, but um, how are they capitalising on Brexit? If we go into a recession post-Brexit, let's say it's a hard Brexit or whatever, if we go into a recession, how are they poised to capitalise on that? If we go into a two-year recession, whether it's a really deep one, whether it's a minimal one, how are they ready to take advantage? If it's a big storm in a teacup, like the, do you remember the Y2K millennium oh, bug yes. that, that was going to like floor the whole infrastructure in uh, globally that never happened. If it's a storm in a teacup and nothing happens and we actually then, there's a bit of pent up suppression at the moment of the market, I won't get too technical, but if Brexit becomes a non-event and, and we just sail through it and then we see a big bubble, how are they poised to capitalise on that? Because... It's very easy pr to predict the market, the property market. Um, it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down. The hard bit is predicting the timing of that. Yeah. So, so long as you are ready to capitalize in a falling market and ready to capitalize in a rising market and ready to capitalize if it tops out in a frothy market or sits in a recession at the depths of a recession for a while, so long as you've got all those bases covered and are ready to make money and to thrive and to grow, who cares? And that's what those guys don't necessarily have because it's very hard. If you imagine you've got a portfolio of 10, 20, 50 houses, it's hard to get off the hamster wheel and sit and work this stuff out. Yeah. Um, but it's um, very important to have your tax all sorted. Your, like the, the, the legislation surrounding property at the moment is changing massively like one of the most dynamic times the last few years ever for property and people are scared of it there's all this negativity in the media 
it's brilliant. It's brilliant for a serious pr professional property investor because the layman, the the man that you know used to, oh, let's get a couple of buy to lets, you know, because we've seen homes under the hammer. Um, that was a lot of competition for us. Those people are now flogging them because they've not understood the tax. They're getting hammered by uh, mortgage rate relief, and we're mopping up. We're, for the first time ever, we're buying more properties from um, professional landlords than we are from private individuals. That's never happened. It used wow. to be 5% five, five <clears throat> and 95%. Now we're about 55% from landlords and 45% from private individuals. It's just an opportunity. So, yeah, it's, it's being strategic about it. And also with that strategy comes conviction and confidence. So if people have a plan, all of our franchisees have a 10-year investment plan. They might only be with us for five years, but it's a 10-year investment plan that we break down into five years, three years, and 12 months. They know each of them have a 90-day plan. So what are they going to do every week, which um, we have fifth, up to 15 tasks every week that they need to do to stay on track for their 10-year goals? When you have that level of clarity and that level of um, specificity about your direction and what you need to do today to stay on track for the next decade, it gives you a sense of confidence. It gives you confidence to go out there and take action. And I'm talking about property, but it could be any area of life. And so we, we also bring that to the table, a, a systematic approach and a considered um approach is that a cookie cutter approach then to each of the investors that, that in terms of that 10-year plan or is that is that something that you've honed and nailed down over the years that you've been doing this to be kind of like this is a this is the way to do it and we'll tweak little bits here and there but for the most part everybody's going to get the same strategy um the system is a result of my wife um vanda was an action coach, global award-winning action coach. Um, if you know action, it's in 50-plus countries. Yeah. She coached business owners. She's coached over 200 business owners over an eight-year period. Um, I have coached business owners um, on, on my journey. It's That, that system has, has been honed by us over, over the last decade or so. Um, so the system is rigid. Everyone follows the same system. So everyone has what we call a yellow goal sheet, which is the 10 to 12 month goals. Everyone has a 90 day plan, quarterly plan. Um, everyone um, um, has a, a, a diary that they follow each week. However, the detail of that is completely variable. So we have 57 investment strategies, 57 monetization strategies, but each franchisee probably averages about four strategies between three and five right so you could have franchisee over here that's doing these five strategies and franchisee over here who's doing these four and their plans would be completely different um so no that that's part of what we help our even on the four months at the start of the four months i sit down for an hour or two with every single client and work out what's best for them based on their level of resource time money experience and their goals and we yeah. plan out what they need to be doing, what strategies are going to suit their situation, where do they live, how much money they got, etc. Um, and then they follow their individual plan within that structure of support, accountability, etc. And if I'm the average Joe who doesn't know fuck all about property, never bought any, I rent uh, at the moment, always have, is, is this something that I can get involved with with you on? So our um, our marketing will all tell you that we are an experienced um, investor franchise, and the reason for that is all of our training is at quite a sophisticated level. So we're not going to teach you how to run a buy to let. If yeah. you if you've never bought a buy to let before and you want to know how to you know credit check a tenant and um, move them in on a single tenancy, single uh, short, short old tenancy agreement, um, it's not going to be a good fit for you because it would just fly over your head. It, it's at a very high level. Um, so we're looking for people who've at least flipped one property before, so bought a for profit, or someone who's had at least quite a let before. So they 
cut their teeth. They understand what's happening. And I, I like paused for a long period of time. There is and for me, I so, mate, we, uh, well, I lost uh, you for a little bit when it, it went a bit um, glitchy. Then, um, could you just uh, repeat all of that for me? Yeah, sure. So, um, what I said was. Um, we are a franchise for experienced property investors. So what we say is that um, as a minimum, we would recommend that people have done at least one flip. So they've bought a property, done some work to it, sold it for a profit, or they have had at least um, one buy to let at some point in, the, in their career. So they know how, they've cut their teeth a little bit because it's quite yeah. a sophisticated franchise you know, a lot of it's going to go over their head if they've never done property before. That said, and the reason I hesitated was we have had um, a couple of exceptions where people haven't done property. In fact, one of our most successful franchisees had never done property before. Um, and she just said, look, I'm so motivated, Frank. I really want to get in on, get into this. I really want to. She actually had a, a heart for the for stepping stones. She's gone on to set up 15 stepping stones houses in her area. Wow. Um, and so um, if I'd been hard and fast about, no, you've not done a buy to let before, I can't. So I do, I am flexible um, on it, but it has to be someone who's really motivated and they're, they've got to be willing to get themselves to that level of education on their own, off their own back. You know, we've got one person at the moment who's just come into it. Um, she's watching three to four hours a day of our video archive. Wow month or two in she's going to be up to speed of some one who's had a bumby you can go on courses and learn how to do a buy to let etc we are for people that want to go from having done a property to doing it um in a sophisticated manner yeah cool it makes a lot of sense um so this this vision of yours to end homelessness worldwide is fair to say a pretty big vision right it's, it's quite a big ask yeah and you mentioned before that it, it's something that's probably not going to happen in your lifetime, but certainly is the seed that you're planting and the legacy that you want to leave <clears throat> ongoing. So I'm, I'm curious around the, the levels of planning that you've done in terms of how this mission is going to be delivered. Now, how far in the future do you look and how do you start to build out a plan that in effect is going to be playing out way beyond even your own death? Okay. Um, what a question, Jamie. Whew, I love it. I love it. I can see why you've got such a successful podcast now. <laughs> Thank you. I thought, uh, I thought Tim Ferriss had his question in nailed, but uh, he, should listen, <laughs> he, he should listen to you. So um, I am a bit of a paradox in terms of my planning, I think. So you've just heard me a couple of minutes ago saying we plan everything. So like I have a, a, a diary for my perfect week. So it's up on my wall in the office. It's what my perfect week looks like. I spend two hours doing this on a Monday. Then I spend four hours on a Tuesday afternoon doing this. That's what I'm aiming for like every week. This podcast isn't in for 10.30 on a Friday morning. I don't do a podcast every Friday. So you never actually achieve your perfect week. But um, because I've done this now, this morning, on this Friday morning, something else will has been missed off. I, I should actually be writing sales copy right now for my my uh, marketing team. And so that will need to be swapped out with, with something else next week to make sure that I achieve that balance yeah. over my weeks. So that's a pretty high level of organization, I think, from my experience of business owners. Um, and my 10-year goal is like getting to <laughs> – we're quite close to getting to 50 franchisees by the end of this year. That was a goal from over two years ago was by Christmas, by the end of 2019, that we'd have 50 franchisees. We're seven off at the moment and we, we might miss it just by a few franchisees. Uh, uh, my projection is that we'll be at about 50, uh, 45. Um, but from two years ago, if you said, Frank, you can have 45 franchisees. And at that point I had, I think, eight or nine, um, I would have been over the moon. So, I have quite tight milestones, quite tight goals, quite a long way in advance. So 10 years, I have 10 year goals. And I, I, every year I sit down, I've got a planning day on um, Monday, actually, which is a quarterly planning day with my crew. How are we on track with our goals? What are our next quarter goals going to be? So from that perspective, I'm really, um, I know where I want to be living in 10 years time. I know how many franchisees we're going to have. Uh, I know a lot about my life in terms of where I'm going. 
The longer term stuff, though, and the ambiguous stuff is I don't know what countries we'll have franchisees in. I know we will be in X number of countries at that point, um, but I was at uh, get which part. Um, I've spoken twice now. A couple of guys came up to me, but and they said, "We are." And they didn't say it like this, but basically, they're very successful business people in Hungary. Now, I had Hungary's not even. I had to look it up on the map. Like whereabouts <laughs> is Hungary? I, I knew roughly, but um, I said, "So, where in Hungary do you live? You live there? Oh, okay, great, great. And what do you do?" And all of a sudden, Hungary's on the map for me. These guys would be awesome at running a country for ethical property partners. So I know I want to be in X number of countries. I don't know which ones they are. Um, so I know we're doing Nepal next year. My, my plan, so my vision over the next, let's say, 40 years, is to keep growing developed countries and have each of those developed countries paired with a developing country that won't have to... So the developed countries' DPP activity will pay to house the homeless in the developing country as well as in the developed one so for, in our example england is housing a lot of homeless people now yeah but the profits from that can then be in, and the fundraising that we're planning to do will then in in uh, end homelessness in, in nepal so we get to the point where england and nepal have no homelessness now um then we could do Wales, and Wales might be teamed up with <laughs> Ethiopia, for example. And, and so I, I haven't mapped it to that degree because the reason we're doing Nepal is one of our franchisees has great links with Nepal. They, they know a whole community. They've been out and they've visited them for the last few years. And so we um, it would be silly to get all oh, sorry. I put a pin in the map completely randomly three years ago that said India. So <laughs> we've just got to go across the border. You know, that, that would be crazy. So so yeah. I know I know enough about where we're going that when the opportunity presents itself, I can grasp it with both hands. But it's flexible enough that I'm not saying no to um, the opportunity that might present itself. Does that answer your question, James? Yeah, it does, yeah. So you've kind of got your 10-year 10, 10 plan sorted, but in terms of the wider legacy, you're open, you kind of know in terms of volume and, and scope where you want to be, um, but the details of that are things... Uh, naturally, if someone comes along and they've got connections in Hungary and you can get a, a step into that country to do this, then you're going to go with that opportunity, right, rather than saying, like you said, oh, no, sorry, I put a pin in a map over here, so we're going to try for that one now. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So you wanted to be by uh, at fifty, uh, at fifty franchisees by the end of two thousand and nineteen. Um, what's what's the ten year goal? So I think that um, England will be at capacity at about two hundred and fifty franchisees. So we've got a way to go before England is is full. Okay, um, because. Each franchisee um, can only do so many transactions, and there's a lot of people that want to sell properties, and there's a lot of people that want to rent properties, and there's a lot of people that want to invest in property. So, um, so I'm quite clear on when England will will max out, um, and then I want to move. And I've 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 been a franchisee of two international franchises. So, um, you might your listeners might be familiar with BNI Business Network International. Yeah. It's the breakfast meetings for business people. I, I ran Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire uh, for three years um, and experienced that franchise on a local level, a regional level, a national level, and an international level. And I mentioned already my wife was a uh, franchisee of um, Action Coach, which is another global um, franchise. Both of those, interestingly, are in over 50 countries. Wow. So I've experienced how they work um, and how they've grown uh, globally and how they operate and that that's my vision that's my vision so in in 10 years time i um am expecting ethical property partners to be a global property investment franchise the interesting part about it is in each country the the strategies will change so in ireland for example in some of your um, listeners might uh, be aware in england at the at the moment it's illegal to buy a house from someone and then rent it back to them it's called sale and rent back it was a oh, big right. thing 10 years ago you're not allowed to do it <clears throat> not allowed to do that anymore um and so everyone stopped doing that in northern ireland you're not allowed to do it it's, it's under the, the same jurisdiction as, as england 
in Southern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, you're allowed to do it. Well, that's a massive opportunity. It's a highly uh, um, uh, lucrative strategy. Um, it's great for the vendors that then get to re rent their houses back so they don't have to move house. It's really good for the investors. Um, a real win-win if it's done properly. It was done really poorly, which is why it's not allowed. But if it's yeah. done property, it's properly, it's a great win-win. Um, and you're still allowed to do it in Southern Ireland. So when, we, when the guy um, bought ireland from us um and has now has the t he's got a 10-year license to run epp in ireland um we sat down with all the lawyers we worked out all the systems um and when we realized so i, I went through everything we want to do and a few of the strategies don't work they for example lending uh buy to let lending in ireland is really limited there aren't many lenders at all there's like 12 lenders which is crazy given that there's like over 100 in um in england wow so that's a disadvantage. But then the flip side is there's these advantages. So in every country, it will be a bit different. And if I'm honest, um, in, in, a, in a former life or in a, uh, if I'd been born slightly differently, I, would, I think I would have been an artist or a sculptor or I, I have this creative streak. And it just so happens that I'm in property. So I love that. The, the thought of sitting down for a couple of days straight with lawyers. I know some people would think it's a nightmare, but we sit down with a tax advisor uh, uh, and a few lawyers and we just crack, crank out what it's going to look like in that country. Uh, that fills me with, uh, with excitement. So, yeah, a glo we will have a global presence in uh, 10 years' time, definitely. That's fantastic. And I suppose in, in, in some respects, this is this is one part to a two-part problem right you know we're talking about homelessness is what you're doing is absolutely phenomenal in terms of giving people who are homeless um, a chance a stepping stone to get from where they are to a better life to get themselves into a property to get a job and to start building something meaningful for themselves what plans do you have if any at this stage to either set something up or partner with another organization to help deal with the the problem at, at source in terms of what's making these people homeless what what's the, the the root of the issue that's putting people onto the streets all over the world and how can we stem that flow at source as well as helping the people who are currently there out and into a better life another great question i love it um so I had two priorities. So when I was setting up Stepping Stones five five years ago, um, I had two priorities. The first was that it had to be self-sustaining. So it had to be able to run indefinitely and not rely on donations or government grants or anything like that. It had to be forever self-funding. So that's the first thing. And I'll, I'll happily go into how we've achieved that. The second part was we couldn't get bogged down with supporting the individual people because that isn't our expertise our expertise is property so we have to focus on um supplying tons of property to these people not on helping the individual people because that's not our area of expertise and we're going to fail at that how can we possibly become experts at um now we house all these people we house um women fleeing abusive relationships, um, kids coming out of care. I say kids, you know, 16, 18 year olds coming out of uh, care. We house people coming out of prison. Um, we house uh, refugees and asylum seekers. We house every, we, um, people with mental disabilities. The whole gambit, we're completely non -military. The only, um, we will house anyone. The only caveat is so long as they are currently being supported by a charity or a project of some kind. Because what we do is we partner with that organization. So we partner with that charity and we say, right, we can see that you're helping, let's take alcoholics, for example. We can see that you're helping alcoholics to rebuild their lives. Would it help you if we provided you with high quality, secure accommodation for your clients? And inevitably, it's a resounding yes. That would be amazing. Because how hard is it for them to help their clients to rebuild their lives whilst they're still on the street? But we're saying, look, I know they won't get into any letting. They'd, they'd not even get their bum on the seat in the letting agency <clears throat> before they will walk back out the, 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 the door. Like yeah. It's impossible for them to access the regular rented sector. Um, they... If they're, if they're lone adults, so if they don't have children, they're going to really struggle to get uh, council housing because there just isn't enough 
um, supported housing uh, uh, available. And so what we're saying is a, is, a, is a massive godsend to these charities. But the deal is the charity has to continue to support these people. And the charity is responsible for achieving maximum occupancy of that property. Because at the end of the day, we've also got an investor that's bought this property for the charity to use yeah. who's got a mortgage to pay. So it's a, it's a win-win. The charity gets, you know, five, six bedrooms in a, in a house. Um, the whole house is theirs, so they control every person in that house. So they control the dynamics. They Some of our charities are in, in the house two hours a day, helping them, you know, with their washing up rotor, helping them go shopping as a, as a, as a, as a, as a household. That is a high level of support that we couldn't possibly provide. Um, other charities, they go in an hour a week and just, how are you doing, guys? You're all good, brilliant. Let's have a quick house meeting. You know, great. See you next week. And it, and the charity dictates what level of support their clients need. But the great thing about the project is when the when the tenants move in, when the clients move in, they typically aren't employed. They won't have a deposit saved up. They won't have a landlord reference. And they almost certainly would fail a credit check. Um, when they leave, which on average is about nine months, so they're only in the room for about nine months, when they leave, they've typically got a job because the charities continue to support them. So like a refugee, speak no English, got none of those things available, don't even have a bank account. When they move into the property, we insist they open a bank account so that when they leave, they've got a credit record. The charity might have helped them, just to use that example, to learn English. They might have got themselves a job, they've saved up a bit of money, and we can give them a landlord reference because they've been a great tenant. Now they can go and get themselves a bed sit in that same town and start rebuilding their life. And the brilliant thing about that is that frees up the bed. So now the charity can move someone else in. So even though the charity might only have a five bedroom house, they might be getting seven or eight people through that house every year, which is moving seven or eight people every year for the next 10, 20 years into or well, out of homelessness and into um, their own accommodation, which, which I think is uh, phenomenal. So we do partner with, well, every ho homeless person that we help is as a result of partnering with an organization. So yeah, we're massive about that. That mate is absolutely fantastic, you know, to, to see what you're delivering here and, and how your vision has materialized and, and actually it's not just this standalone thing that could lead on to those same people failing in, in a couple of months after getting out if they didn't have that ongoing support, to see that it's actually become a much needed missing link in a chain of support is just phenomenal to see and, and it sounds like from what you've just described that they're getting everything they need not in term not only in terms of the property and the accommodation and a roof over their heads from you guys but for that ongoing support from a dedicated charity who deals specifically with whatever issue it is that that particular person faces i think is absolutely fantastic thank you um i had another question i was going to ask you but it's gone from my head <laughs> Uh, while you're thinking about it, Jamie, I want to suggest an invention, mate. I Go think you need some. He I think you need some headphones where the headband goes up like that over your mohawk like that. Cause totally it must do. mess it up every every time. It must mess it up for you. Yeah, look what a what a mess. <laughs> we need to sort that. <laughs> I end up with a partially flat mohawk at the back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's it's gone from my head for now, mate. Um, but I, I just love everything that you shared today. I, I love what you're all about and, and the, vis the vision, the mission, and the way that you help and serve people who really do need to be helped, uh, who really do need that support, and uh, may it long continue. Um, anything that we can do to support is, uh, and, you know, obviously helping you get the message out through this show is, you know, we're more than happy to do that. Um, what else would you like to share with the viewers before we wrap things up? Well, um, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show, Jamie. It's fab and as much publicity as, uh, as we can get. We're always uh, after that. Um, in, because when people hear our message, they are often moved in different ways to get involved in different ways. Some people want to become franchisees. Fantastic. Some people just want to donate money, which is brilliant because we can then put that into We, we have an FCA accredited housing um, fund. So that's where people can, um, FCA is Financial Conduct Authority. Um, People who don't necessarily want to own property can put money into that fund, can lend money to it, 
they get a return of 5% fixed guaranteed return on that money. And we use that money solely um, for housing the homeless. And so some people like get involved in that way. Some people um, will sell us houses. Um, sometimes they'll sell us houses at a discount because they know we're going to house the homeless in them. So that's fantastic. Some people say, do you know what? I never thought of being a landlord, but I've got 30K in the bank. I'd love to buy a house, you know, with a mortgage, you can buy a house for 30K. Um, uh, that will get you a house in Nottingham, Derby, et cetera, 100K house. And I'd love to, if you're going to manage it for us, which is what we do, we do the whole thing. The, the landlord never even has to see the property. Um, some people will say, look, here's a chunk of money. You go find me a house. I'll buy it. You house four or five homeless people in it. Um, pay me a return. They'll get their 7%. 8% return on their money, plus they'll get capital growth um, and, and we'll manage it all for them. They never even have to see it. So some people will be in, interested in that regard. Um, however, people want to get involved. Maybe people don't care about property investment. They just want to house the homeless. Brilliant. Get in touch with us. Um, we had one lady contact us uh, as a result of um, one of these uh, interviews. And she said, I have no interest in any of that, but um, I'm great with charities. Would you like me to go and beat the drum to charities and get charities to come partner with. and and now she's just this month come on board one day a week just her sole role for us at headquarters is outreach to charities and getting them in so they can partner with our franchisees around the country so you never know how how this message might, might who this message might might reach all i would say is if you are interested in um, learning out, learning more. If you're interested in, you might, might not know how, but if this has resonated with you, either the property aspect, the housing, the homeless aspect, any aspect at all, then um, I'd say Facebook's the best way of getting in touch with us. Um, there's not many Frank, Frank flags on Facebook. Uh, I don't think I don't think any of them wear these crazy uh, bright check shirts. And um, our Facebook group, it's a closed group, um, but if you apply to join it if you say that you've come from this podcast jamie keeling's uh, podcast then um we will accept you in um i post in that every single day every single working day there's a post in that about what we're doing um about how people can get involved um the name of the facebook group is sophisticated property investment uk and again you'll see me on the front of that um but failing that google us ethical property partners and you can even come visit me and have a cup of tea with me. But if you're interested, if this has touched you in any way, then I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, Fantastic. Thanks, and, and all the links to all that stuff will be in the show notes as well for the listeners and on the audio. Um, Thank you. So two questions I have, I've remembered now. One was, <laughs> what, what advice would you, like your vision and the mission that you've embarked upon is, is really, really inspiring. And um, what advice would you give to other just general people i guess but also you know business owners entrepreneurs people who are out there and they, they want to build a vision that's as impressive as yours but in their own way what advice can you give them on how to go about doing that okay um i have spoken on this topic quite a few times actually and uh, and that I, I actually should have added a moment ago if you are if you run an event if you are interested in me coming and speaking i'd be really keen to do that just to get the message out there Brilliant. um what i say to people who um I, I don't think it's about having an impressive mission you know i, I use the example of saving bears in asia uh, earlier i i just think it has to float your boat so long as it who cares what other people think if, it, if it's important to you it could be cats in leicester you know, no, no, no stray cats in Leicester. We're going to solve all that. Who cares if that's important to you? But I, but I think it's absolutely crucial to have something that's bigger than you. Um, and when I say bigger than you, bigger than your life, our small life, and bigger than our lifetime, like like we talked about, uh, extending beyond us as a legacy. Um, and what I say to people is, start <clears throat> today. Don't put it off. Don't wait till you're Warren Buffett wealthy. Don't wait till you have paid your mortgage off. Don't wait till you own your car without any finance. Don't wait until you've got that expensive car. Don't wait until um, you've got X amount of money in the bank because it won't come. And, um, and, and just think about it. If I had started this when I was 18, 19, imagine how many people I could have housed now. Imagine how many people would have joined me on this journey and been involved. And um, 
I, at many points, I started five years ago, but I could have started a lot earlier. And I'm proud of what I'm achieving now, but I am a little um, aware that I could have started a lot earlier. And so what I say to people is, you know, if, if you could only have afford two hours a week, who can't afford two hours a week? Who can't get up half an hour earlier every day and, and, and crank out an extra two hours a week on something else? You know, if you get up at seven, get up at half six and write a few emails, um, put an advert out there, go buy someone a McDonald's meal, what, whatever it is. Um, and who can't afford 50 pounds a month? You know, can, can you really not park your car around the corner and walk an extra 300 yards and save yourself four pound parking? Or yeah. the, the example always is a, a, a coffee at Starbucks. Or how many I, I, people sometimes say it's only 10 coffees a month. And I'm thinking, yeah, but it's 10 that that person talked about. And 10 that that person, I don't drink 100 <laughs> a month. But, but that, 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 that principle of, you know, do I need a takeaway on a Friday? If I just cooked for myself, that just saved me to 15 pounds. So c- c- where can you find couple hours a week, 50 quid a month, whatever it may be, it might be 10 quid a month, who cares? But start doing something with it now, whatever that is. Start volunteering at the cat sanctuary or start um, volunteering on a Friday night to help the drunk people come out of the pub safely or whatever your, your passion is. But do something because when you st- – that first step starts – the momentum starts the um uh, the snowball rolling and before you know it you are um where you wanted to be much much earlier um the danger is you say oh i know i'll put 10 pound a month in a bank account and then it gets to a bigger chunk of money and you think yeah but i really need that five star hotel uh, five star holiday mm-hmm. and and you go back to square one whereas if you're meeting let's call it you know, let's say it's a food bank. If you're working at a food bank two hours a week and you're meeting people that need that food, it becomes a lot more real. But then you're going to meet other volunteers that are doing the same thing. And then you're going to hear about another project that you can get involved in. And, oh, there's an allotment. Ah, I'm a gardener. I never thought about how gardening could, you know, and and, and it just snowballs. And a bit like the lady who didn't want to invest in property, um, didn't have money to invest, but was brilliant with charities. She bought someone to me last week who works at one of the largest housing charities in, in the East Midlands. And they came to my office. How long would it have taken me to reach someone of that calibre um, without that introduction? So my, my, my message always is just start, however small, and see where it leads you. You're right, and that's great advice. And it's amazing how even just a, a few simple conversations can start opening doors when you put that intention out there. And like you say, you start to gather that momentum. People start to, you know, like when you speak at, on stage, people hear about what you talk about and what you do, and they're like, "Fuck yeah!" Do you know that sounds great. I can really resonate with that. I, how can I possibly get involved? And without talking about it, without having those conversations, and it's not to say you've got to be on a stage in front of three hundred you know a thousand people or whatever it is just having conversations with your mates down the pub you don't know who they know who can start opening doors for you so i think that's solid solid advice um the other place we know each other from frank uh, we were in the room together not so long ago at a, an appster mind would you like to talk about how app technology is coming into what you do yeah sure so we are soon to launch the ethical property partners app um and we are very very keen to do two things one make it easier for people to engage with us who aren't currently clients so people that want to find out about what we're doing they want to um get involved in all those different areas of 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 um ethical property partners um so they can consume video content they can see the um, properties that we're doing, the developments that we're doing, the the um, properties that we're converting to on the Stepping Stones project, etc., um, and get involved that way. But equally, um, I mentioned that we've got this vault of information. Now, at the moment, it sits on a Google Drive, so people have to use their laptop to get into it and, and consume these videos. Um, we have already actually moved. It's over a terabyte of data, which for those of you that wow. don't know, that's that's a lot of data. It's it's in the app. The app's still going through development and final um, final checks and stuff. But um, 
that terabyte of data people can now consume franchisees and clients so people on the four months people on the franchise can now watch those videos on their commute to work they can listen to the audios whilst they're working out at the gym so we're just keeping with the times really and making it easier for people making it easier for people to follow and support us making it easier for our clients to to learn and grow and develop um, through leveraging technology Fantastic. And that comes from the same people who've developed my Bulletproof Business app. That's Expert Apps. Uh, they've got a massive, uh, little shameless plug, they've got a massive Cedar Set campaign going on at the moment. Uh, they've already funded a lot of that investment to bring this technology out to more businesses, entrepreneurs, and people who are doing great things in the world, just like Frank. Um, so if you do want to get involved with that, you can sign up for Cedar's search Expert Apps and do that now. Um, what's your, when's your app going to be out, Frank? So um, can I just jump back to Cedars? Um, yeah, sure. If this gives your listeners any um, uh, reassurance. So I'm a client of Expert Apps, but I'm also, I'd, I'd uh, uh, like to say, a pretty switched on investor given given uh, my, my profession. Um, I've invested in the Cedars campaign. So I am an investor in Expert Apps as well. So I can say uh, with 100% confidence, I've done my due diligence and I think it's a... Uh, from a purely financial perspective, a really uh, solid investment. Uh, so yeah, I've put my own money into it. Um, the app we are shooting for, and uh, you nailed me down here. Uh, we haven't even we haven't even announced it yet. Um, but we are optimistic of a 2019 launch but um, as you know, with technology and large projects, and it is a large project. Um, timelines can slip but that's where we're, we're optimistic for december yeah. well look if anybody can achieve that then i know <laughs> the team at expert apps can uh you know you know as well as i do how well they've served all of us as investors in the mm. community and for full disclosure i too not only have my app built designed and developed by expert apps but i've also put my own money into the cedars campaign just for full disclosure for those who are watching. But yeah, I agree with you, Frank. A fantastic investment, fantastic company doing great things. Um, but, you know, I know Darren and Danny quite well, the founders of Expert Apps, and they're just great human beings. And one of the things that made me want to invest with them was that, look, they had a great idea. And if anybody could bring that to life, Darren and Danny can. So well worth checking out if you're looking for something like that at the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Cool. Um, so I'd just like to finish with three quick questions, if I may. Um, what is your morning routine like? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I've spent the last 10 years studying this. I think it's massive, uh, massively important. I am running a three-day retreat for all our clients next month um, where we not only cover tons of um, property education, but we also... Um, teach and you didn't know any of this so this is, it's, a, it's a really uh, um, a coincidental question but um, we teach morning routine and then practice it over three days Fantastic. so my I know yeah <laughs> so um, the, the retreat runs 6 a.m. through till 10 p.m. it's a really long day um, uh, to, to also exemplify exemplify and demonstrate how much time we all have in the day and what we can get done and it's a very balanced day you don't you don't get to the end and you you are tired but you sleep well and then you get up and and at the end of the three days the our goal is that people realize wow like there is so much spare capacity in my life to get stuff done um and, and when i say stuff work stuff but also health and fitness stuff downtime you know thinking time etc relationship yep. time um, and, and want to carry on. That's the goal. Um, so my actual personal morning routine starts at 5 a.m. I get up at 5. Um, I'm in bed by about 10, and that doesn't suit everyone. I can get away with one light, late night a week and still function at the 5 a.m. Um, I'm getting to the point I've only been – it always used to be half 6, and then it got to 6, and now it's 5. I've only been at 5 a.m. for about – three months or so and i'm now at the point where my body wakes up interestingly about six hours um sorry seven hours um after i go to bed so oh, if okay. i do go to if i go to bed early because i'm tired i wake up early so i can wake <laughs> up earlier um, but my body is starting to adapt to that um energy levels are are solid i've energy all day long now 
Um, but I do uh, listen to my body. So if I'm tired, especially if, I'd a, if I've had a late night, I force myself, even if I've been to bed really late, to get up at five because I think that body clock resetting is really important. This is just my personal take on it. You know, a sleep psychologist might, you know, tear me to pieces, but it works for me. Um, but I listen to my body. So if I'm tired, I won't let myself go back to bed um, until about mid-morning. So if I'm tired and it gets to like half 10, 11, or 1 or 2 p.m., um, then I do go and have a siesta. I'm more than happy with that. Um, the reason being, my time between 5 and 8 is mega productive much more so than between nine and five. So going for a half an hour, an hour kip in the day, I miss out way less than missing out, you know, staying in bed until 6 a.m. Yeah. for me personally. That makes a lot of so, sense. So to answer your question about the routine, <clears throat> up at five, um, I always used to exercise first thing, but I don't anymore. Um, I will get some fresh air. Um, I have a pool outside, uh, a swimming pool. It's like an endless pool. Um, I don't use it for training at that time, but I get into it at that time. And the reason for that is it's unheated. So depending on the time of year, it will be at the moment, it's about 16 degrees. That is chilly, <laughs> really chilly. Um, puts hairs on your chest. So I'll jump in. I'll spend like three or four minutes in the pool. I'll turn the, um, the current on and I'll swim against it. Not to train, you know, three or four minutes isn't that useful to really wake you up. And boy, you jump out and you're like, um, you have a, I have a cold shower afterwards, but because the cold water's come through the house, it feels like a warm shower. That's how cold the water is outside. Wow. Um, the, and in winter, so give it, give it February and it'll be at like five degrees. And that, that really is cold. Um, so you don't have to do that, but if you look into the um, science behind it, if you like listen to Tony Robbins, like he he has a plunge pool, a cold plunge pool in every house around the world that he has. Um, so I do that, um, and then I spend a lot of time um, on me, on my goals. I call it Mojo Minutes, and it's actually like a two-hour routine that I that I follow. Um, but I'll look at my um, dream charts. I'll develop my dream chart. Um, I'll look at my yellow goal sheet that I mentioned earlier. I'll review my 90-day plan, my quarterly plan. Um, I'll do some creative work. So I might um, write a letter to myself in 10 years' time, or I might um, start with a blank sheet of paper and just put a topic in the middle and do a brainstorm that um, I want to just, you know, a problem that I might have or an opportunity that. I've, so the app, for example, I've done, I've spent quite a few chunks of time on the app development to think, you know, and it's in a very different place now than where it was before. So you're never going to get a phone call. Well, I don't get phone calls between five and seven. So that, that doesn't get interrupt me. No one else is up. I've got two young boys, um, six and eight. They're both asleep until half seven generally. My wife doesn't get up till um, around then. And if she is up and about, she knows that I'm, uh, you know, doing my own thing. Um, and so I'll spend quite a lot of time doing that. I'll generally eat at that time as well whilst I'm doing this. So I might sit and eat while I'm um, doing my mojo minutes. I have a day in the life. So it's my perfect day in the life in 10 years time. And I run through that and it's on a PowerPoint and it's got a soundtrack to it. And it just, it's reinforcing my subconscious all the time. Um, where am I headed? Where am I going? And it's all in the present tense. So it's like, I got up at five this morning. Um, I loved opening the window and seeing the sea outside. I live in Derbyshire. We could not be further from the sea, but it's reinforcing the fact that I'm yeah. going to end up living by the sea. Um, I look outside and I can see my boys training on their ponies. You know, our garden's the size of a tennis court. We don't have any ponies, but it, 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 it's that destination mastery, being clear on, on where, where we're headed. Um, and I do affirmations. So, you know, we have ended homelessness globally. I feel fantastic uh, that my legacy, uh, my vision for my legacy has, has come true. Um, we have 250 franchisees in England. We have transformed their lives. They um, love the fact that they each have their own legacy, that they're those kind of empowering. And, and the thing is, if you do that between um, five and eight, I'm then ready to sit at my desk and be you know, in the office for when the team arrive. Um, you, you've already won the day. You yeah. can't lose the day at that point, um, and I get more. I get as much done in that three hours than I than I do the rest of the day. Often, um, I make sure that I train in the day, so I'll go for a jog, I'll go to the gym. It might only be 
30 minutes, 40 minutes, sometimes it's an hour. Um, but I think it's important to burn some calories, get the blood, blood pumping. Um, and the rest fits around that. that those are the rocks, really. Um, I do my best to pick up my kids from school at least three times a week. So generally a Wednesday, Thursday and a Friday. Um, and I walk them to school twice a week. And that, that's important to me that I see them in their school uniform. I've coached business owners who have never seen their kids in their school uniform. And I just think that's sad, you know. Yeah. Um, um, and, and I work long hours. I still work 50, 60 hours a week. Um, but by choice and in balance. And for some people that wouldn't be balanced, but I just, I, I enjoy it. I love it. So That's a brilliant answer. And I love <laughs> how you've got that balance, not only in the morning routine, but the stuff you do at the end of the day as well. And uh, it's really interesting. I ask that question of every single guest, guest I have on the show. Um, and it's always really interesting seeing how that answer differs, differs from person to person. Um, who inspires you the most and why? Um... I have a, we have educational concepts on the partnership. So we have over 60 of them now. And I spend five, 10, 15 minutes doing videos on each one and, and your listeners. Um, oh, I forgot to say, if when they join the group, they say that they've come from this podcast. Um, I, I spoke to the team and uh, yesterday and I said, look, what can we give Jamie's listeners? And I nearly forgot this. Glad, glad I remembered. Um, what can we give them? And we came up with a um, a twelve module course um, that we usually sell for ninety seven pounds. People have paid that for it, um, and uh, we'll give it free to them. So it's a twelve module course. It's over six hours of content, and there are some educational concepts in there. That's what the the penny just dropped for me. So if they just mention you when they join the Facebook group, we'll send that out to them. Fantastic. Um, and just remind everyone what the Facebook group was called. Yeah, it's Sophisticated Property Investment UK. Cool. <clears throat> but we do all our stepping stones, homeless stuff on there as well. Brilliant. Um, so, um, so one of our educational concepts um, is, so we have many of these, we have over, over, over 60 of these, as I mentioned, um, is the board of, um, the virtual board. That's what we call it. We call it the virtual board. And the idea behind that, and the reason I'm, not answering your question is because it's not one person jamie i don't i'm i'm me i look up to many people but i can't hand on heart say that i'm trying to emulate any one of them so what what this educational concept's all about all this um um strategy is is you have a virtual board so it's a board table boardroom in your head and you have whoever you want around that table so I have one of my franchisees around the table. Um, she runs a church um, uh, with her husband, a massively successful franchisee. Um, but when I am challenged um, from a Christian perspective, from a faith perspective, I think of her and I, I, I almost have a conversation with her and I go, what should I do from a, you know, what would the Bible tell me to, cause she's like been to Bible college and stuff like that. I haven't, you know, so I go, what would she be telling me? I think she'd be telling me this. And then when I'm thinking about, you know, how should I structure the sale of the franchise to, to Ireland? I've got Brad Sugars on there. I don't know if you know Brad Sugars. He's the founder of Action Coach. Um, I've met him a few times. Vanda knows him really well. Um, uh, Random, my wife. Um, he sat on there. He doesn't know he's on my board, but I ask him questions, and I, I like go to him. So, Brad, <laughs> uh, you, you go Frank who? <laughs> but, um, but I go, Brad. What should I be doing here? Should I be like going for the jugular and squeezing every inch of this out, or should I just be a bit more relaxed because it's my first one? And I just hear these people talking to me, um, and I've got probably ten or twelve people around there. I've got Richard Branson on there because he says I've read all his books. He says. Um, say yes and work out how afterwards, you know, and I think what would Richard, Richard Branson was the deal, deal a day guy. That's, that's what people used to call him. Um, so I, I ask him and he goes, just do it, Frank, you know, Grant Cardone sat next to him. Just do it. You know, work 26 hours a day. Just do it, man. <laughs> sell, sell, sell. And you've got him. And then you've got, <clears throat> and you've got other people on there, people that you wouldn't know, but people from my life, like I've got my dad on there, for example. Um, my dad has worked no more than 15 hours a week since he was um, 30. Now, you might think he's really rich, 
because of that. And he is. He's massively rich, but he's massively rich in time. Um, he retired like in his 50s completely from work. His, um, I've never disclosed this before, but I'm sure you wouldn't mind me saying, um, he lives on way less than a thousand pound a month. Way, way less. Wow. And so he has designed a life for himself that doesn't require him to work. Um, his eyes water when he sees what my household expenses are in a given <laughs> month. <you know? laughs> but but I look to him, and 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 so you've got Richard Branson going, um, go do it, Frank, and you've got my dad going, hang on, Frank, why are you doing this? Remember, Frank, it's all about. And he's not a, a faithful man; he's he's a, an atheist. But he would say it's all about being happy, Frank. You know, why are you working? You're working to earn money. Great. Why are you earning money to have experiences? Great. Why do you want experiences and stuff to be happy? So hang on a second. Are you really saying that being away from your family for that whole week to work, to go earn that money is going to make you happier? And then you think, oh yeah, actually, hmm. And and so you you I, I consult with my virtual board, and I I find that really really helpful. I've got healthy people on there, people that I respect massively. They might be rubbish at business, but they might be awesome at prioritizing their health. So I sit on there and I think, do you know what? I am heavy at the moment. I haven't trained for three days. You're right. I need to say no to this because otherwise it's going to be a week I haven't trained for and that's not good for me. And it's just just good. I think it's good. When do you have yeah. those conversations with this board? Because what you're describing here is, is pretty much exactly the masterminding concept from Napoleon Hill. Yeah. You can grow rich, isn't it? Yeah, without having to like pay them any money and without them yeah, having yeah. to waste without them having to invest their time in me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I am in a real life mastermind um, too, actually, um, where, I, and I think they're invaluable as well. Um, if you choose wisely um the principle behind it um what was your question james so precisely it was um, when do you <clears throat> take the time to uh, consult yeah. with the board yeah um often in that morning in my mojo minutes often i'll sit there and, and that that it might not be a visualization it might be the mind mapping and yep. then i'm like because I'm in the habit of it now, it comes quite naturally. But often it'll be when I'm, you know, if, if you and I are sat around the table and we're talking about a, a potential JV or a potential way of working together or a marketing campaign, I'll, I'll be doing it subconsciously. I'll be doing it silently, consciously, in my head, thinking, "Does this fit with me?" And I think, "What does my gut say?" And then I think, "Yeah, but what do they say around the table?" Um, so all the time, actually you know any time of the day and it can take me 10 seconds it can take me 20 minutes um sometimes i am sat there with my eyes closed visualizing it sometimes i'm chatting to you whilst thinking i know so and so would think this is brilliant but i also know that so and so wouldn't mm. and and that might just be enough to go jamie i love this idea it sounds great can i get back to you next week yeah. you know it's enough just to put the brakes on mm. or you know, I think to myself, this feels good to me. I, I like how this person's talking. I like this proposal. Um, let's just bounce it off. Yeah, I think think that person on my board would say yes. I think that, yeah, it's ticking all the boxes. I can't see a problem. I'll tell you what, let's crack on with it. Let's say yes and work out how later, you know. And, mm. and, and so I, I would say it's a skill at the, at the start. It's hard, you know, and you might even draw a, a circle on your paper and write the names of the people on there. On my um, dream chart, I've actually got their pictures, the, the people on my dream chart oh, to, awesome. to, so that I can actually visualize, yeah, I'm mentored by these people. Now, some of them, it's actually on my dream board. I get a one-to-one -one coaching session with this person once a month. Now, uh, Tony Robbins is on there, for example. He's on my virtual board as well. He's a million dollars a year uh, for one-to-one. -one. And I think you get a session every two months or a session every quarter i can't remember exactly plus he wants 10 percent of the upside <laughs> <laughs> so whatever he helps you make he takes 10 percent um so i'm not i'm not there i'm not there in a position where it's economically sensible um i'm not i'm not wealthy enough to invest a million pounds a million dollars a year in in one mentor um but he's on there he's on my dream chart um i've got brad sugars on there uh as well um i write an email to brad sugars every um 18 months or so saying would you like to mentor me one-to-one -one now this is where i'm at and three years ago he said uh it, it, it was a no um 18 months ago it was a no i'm about to write again and and it's just i've got crystal clarity that he's going to mentor me at some point last time we were you know 20 odd franchisees now we're getting on for 50 and we're in two countries at some point he'll go yes 
yeah. I'll mentor you now, Frank. And, and it's about that clarity. But I'd, like some people wouldn't, and I didn't say this earlier, but I want to add it now. That two hours a week where you get going, and it, it's, a, it's an arbitrary figure. It can be five, it can be 20 minutes a week. You won't get much done. But, you mm. know, that two hours a week has to be outreach. It can't be sat on Facebook reading posts it can't be watching youtube because nothing's going to happen you can do that forever yeah. there are so many armchair experts out there that have never done anything um, and it has to be you you said chatting to your mates that's proactive that's getting out there it's, it's outreach isn't it yeah. if you did only that it would be quite limited but you need to be writing to people you need to be going and meeting people and having purposeful conversations uh, me sending an email to, to to brad sugars every 18 months saying um i'd like you to mentor me now he's a busy guy whether or not he even reads those emails i don't know but that's 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 me outreaching it takes me 10 minutes yeah. to bang him an email saying this is where i'm at I'd love you to mentor me. I want you to help me end homelessness globally. Um, funnily enough, because I've told other people that story, someone came to me and said, did you know Brad Pitt is buying houses and housing the homeless? And I was like, no, I didn't know that, but he's on my list. I'm going to start writing to him as well. Fantastic. And, and, and that's it. You get your, you get your, <clears throat> your um, message out there. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, Final question then for you is um, kind of bringing it all together now. If you could go back to when you were a teenager, say back to when you first had that idea, when you had that house, what's the one piece of advice you would give yourself? Um, I'm loath to change anything because I love my life and I love where I'm at. Um, I'm really, the butterfly effect scares me a bit. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'd be really... Um, nervous about changing anything but um i had a fantastic upbringing i, I absolutely living in west wales i was a fell runner uh, i ran internationally um um pulled tug of war for wales believe it or not as a teenager um and um was academically um very blessed i i, I found learning a joy and enjoyed uh gcse and a levels um I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but in West Wales, uh, it, it was fine to go to a pub and buy a pint at like the age of 16. They were really relaxed. So um, at, at A-levels, we'd like go for, a, I, my, my, old, my old head teacher will shoot me now, but uh, we, <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd go for our lunch in town in our school uniforms and have a pint at lunchtime playing pool uh, and then go back for, 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 for That's lessons. brilliant. <laughs> I, cr I cringe to say that now as an old teacher. I've never said that publicly, but, but it, it was a good time. Um, I worked I, I worked as a lifeguard and then a swimming teacher during A-levels, worked really hard. Um, I trained every day um, uh, for my running um, and studied really hard. It was a brilliant time in my life. And everyone kept saying, you're going to love university. It's the best years of your life. Um, and so I set the bar like ridiculously high for university. And when I got to university, um, I had no money because I was living at home and earning like, I don't know what, I was earning 50 quid a week or something as a lifeguard and um, could not spend it. Like I couldn't spend 50 pounds a week. Um, uh, and so I was like really relaxed, um, really supported um, at home. I had loads of friends um, during A-levels. I went to uni, I knew no one. I then had to pay food. Like I had, I had a hardship grant, as I mentioned. Um, I, I lived on, um, I remember my food bill per week, I was self-catered, was 11 pounds something. It was under 12 pounds a week. Um, so I went to like, I went teetotal because it was too expensive to pay for, but like everyone was at Freshers drinking themselves <laughs> senseless. And I was, I was, I was working double shifts in the swimming pool to, 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 to earn money. And the problem was um, I lost my social circle and didn't create a new one because I, that's a pretty odd thing to do as a, as a student. And, um it was it it was a it was an okay time university for me um but i wish i'd go back and i'd just go do you know what lighten up a bit on the finances um i'd, I'd borrowed some money from my parents like from my gap year and i repaid it all within my first year of uni so i'd not only paid for all my accommodation paid for all my food at uni and everything but i also saved money and repaid um uh, i think i'd borrowed like a thousand pounds or 1500 pounds from my parents so um i would probably go back to myself and say your parents will be okay wait a couple more years like 
go easy on that. Try going out for a beer during freshers, you know, make some friends. Um, I'd probably go into halls and have food because I think it's a bit more communal. And if anyone's listened to this before uh, before going to uni or you've got kids going to uni, I'd not recommend self-catering halls. I think they're a bit antisocial. Um, and I would massively reduce my expectations because when you've got expectations right up there, it was just a bit of an anticlimax. But um, as I said at the start, I'd be nervous because... I love the journey since. That was a tough three years for me. Um, but if I hadn't had that experience, would I have met my mate who bought the house, uh, having in, inherited the money from yeah, his dad? Yeah. Um, I might have had a different group of friends because as it happened, he was like a, a mega athlete. Well, well, he was training twice a day and we kind of hit it off because neither of us went to drinking beer. You know, we were both quite healthy, um, both a bit oddballs really. <laughs> um, and... I might not have met him, so then I might not have had the idea about stepping stones and, you know, it could have been a very different interview we're having now. So, yeah, but that's probably the one thing I'd go back and just give myself a little post-it note on the fridge. Frank, I could sit and talk to you all day, mate. I've really, really enjoyed having you on the show today. So thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy and uh, I really appreciate you taking a couple of hours out to come on and talk to me. Um, just before we wrap up, just remind people where they can, you know, the name of the group, uh, where they can connect with you, where's the best place to get hold of you and all that good stuff. Yeah, so I'm Frank Flegg. There's not many of us on social media and I'm always in a bright checked shirt. So you'll, you'll spot me. Um, Facebook, uh, come join us in the closed Facebook group. Mention Jamie Keeling, and we'll give you the the ninety seven pound uh, property investment course free of charge. Um, Sophisticated Property Investment UK is that group. Um, the website is ethicalpropertypartners.com So come join us there. You can find out about everything you've heard about the Stepping Stones project. You can find out about the um, partnership, etc. Um, and look out for the app coming soon fantastic frank if there's anything i can do to help in the future please do let me know it's been a pleasure having you on the show thank you so much for your time today have a phenomenal weekend buddy thanks jamie thanks for having me take, take care, care mate bye, Cheers. bye bye amazing that was mr frank flake ladies and gentlemen i didn't expect that one to go for a whole hour and 46 minutes um a little bit of editing to do in that but still what a fantastic guy with an amazing story and doing as i'm sure you'll agree some truly inspirational and much needed work in the world for homeless people all over so fantastic i uh, really enjoyed that got a lot out of that so i hope you did too thank you very much to everybody who's tuned in today not only on the live but for those of you who have downloaded and listened as well do remember to hit subscribe if you haven't already and leave us a cheeky little review on itunes it'll take you probably all of about a minute by the time you've gone in there and written something lovely about us um, and look it just helps people find the great content that can help them be the best that they possibly can be so would really appreciate appreciate you doing that for me um also if you're in business and you're wanting to take things to the next level or you're just feeling at the moment like you're stuck in a rut then please do go and download my bulletproof business app it is a phenomenal tool for business owners all over the world uh, and you can get that you just search bulletproof business on on your iphone or um uh, filthy android uh, but you can use bit.ly forward slash bulletproof business if you are a sexy apple user and a bit.ly forward slash bulletproof android if you are a filthy android user um, so go and download that come in and say hello you can uh, just get yourself logged into there it's totally free and uh, the the stuff that we're releasing in there over the coming months and years is going to absolutely blow your mind so um, the next podcast episode is going to be on Friday, the 1st of November. So we're having a gap week next week. Um, next one, as I say, is going to be two weeks. That'll be going out live on Friday, the 1st of November at 10.30 a.m., and uh, so yeah, make sure you go and connect with me over on Facebook if you haven't already to uh, to watch that live, if that's something that interests you. Um, otherwise, a few weeks after that, you can get the interview on uh, on iTunes. Uh, Kate is uh, one of my clients actually through the Bulletproof Business Academy. She's a multiple business owner, although she hates the term entrepreneur. And she's going to be coming on talking about the perils of family business and how her own experiences have helped to build two successful businesses um, in completely different fields. And uh, Kate and I have been through some very similar experiences in terms of uh, both coming or starting our entrepreneurial lives with 
um, with the family business. And um, she's not only very knowledgeable around staffing, team building and, and HR, but also uh, as an entrepreneur, although as much as I know she hates that phrase, um, between her and husband, Simon, and co-director, um, they they built some truly fantastic businesses uh, in both health and safety and coaching. So really excited to have Kate on the show next week. Do make sure you tune on on Facebook for that one and download it when it's up on iTunes. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a wrap for this week. Thank you very much for your ongoing support. Thank Thanks very much for listening and until next time stay optimized